The following program was made possible by the generosity of those who have determined to hold fast to the traditional Catholic faith and religion as professed and practiced by the Roman Catholic Church before the disasters of the Second Vatican Council and the so-called New Order of Mass. Hello. Welcome to this edition of What Catholics Believe. In this, I'd like to address, uh, again, a matter of Archbishop Carlo Maria Viganò's charge that fr Francis knew about the depredations of Cardinal Theodore McCarrick abusing youngsters, uh, immorally uh, dealing with them, and uh, that Francis actually freed him up to commit more crimes and, furthermore, uh, used his advice in choosing bishops for the modern church. Um, Francis himself said that he would not respond one word to these accusations and then began immediately to denounce the accusers as doing the work of Satan. That was Francis's response, to say that those who were, uh, let's say, revealing the abuse the sexual abuse of, of young people, of minors, by the clergy of the Nova Serra Church, those who were revealing this were actually doing the work of Satan, not those who were doing the abuse, but those who were making it known that the crimes were being committed, that they were doing the work of Satan. Okay? But never was there a denial from Francis that he knew what was happening or that he used the advice of Theodore McCarrick in choosing bishops for the Nova Sordo. Now, the reason I'm mentioning this now is because there has been a great deal of um, vitriol directed against Archbishop Viganò, who is in hiding now, as he says, in fear for his life. And uh, the press has attacked him, the, the, the Nova Sordo press has attacked him, and uh, so many, uh, some of his fellow bishops have attacked him. Then uh, Archbishop Viganò came out recently, and uh, among a number of other things he said in his own defense, was that a Cardinal Marc Ouellette of Canada, who is the, the um, Cardinal is the prefect of the Congregation for Bishops, knows the truth and can certify the truth of what Archbishop Viganò has said about Francis. Now, Cardinal Ouellette has responded, and he's written a three-page letter, a public letter, to Archbishop Viganò reproving him and condemning what he's doing. But it's a very interesting letter by Cardinal Ouellet because it doesn't actually constitute a denial. It actually constitutes a confirmation of what Archbishop Viganò is saying. Even while Cardinal Ouellet is condemning Viganò as having broken communion with, with Francis. He is actually implicitly acknowledging the truth of what Archbishop Viganò is saying here, what he's charging. This letter has become rather famous. It is being commented uh, widely uh, in the media right now. I think it's very necessary for us to be aware of it and how it actually endorses the, the accusation, seconds, as it were, the accusation made by uh, the very man whom this cardinal is denouncing. Now, first of all, well, let, 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 me, let me just start up by saying that this is a response of this Cardinal Marc Ouellette <coughs> to um, Archbishop Viganò appealing to him as knowing that and being able to, to certify that what Archbishop Viganò said was true. And this letter of Cardinal Ouellette asks Viganò to return to full communion with the successor of Peter. <clears throat> As though he's saying, you have broken communion with the successor of Peter. 
That's an accusation against Archbishop Vigano by making this accusation and even going so far as to say that Francis should set the, set the tone, should lead the way in resigning for not only having tolerated this evil, but actually having encouraged it by his actions. So anyway, <clears throat> the Holy See's press office published this open letter by Cardinal Marc Ouellet, the prefect for the Congregation of Bishops, as it says here. And I, I want to point out also that as the prefect for the Congregation of Bishops, clearly this Cardinal Ouellet would have been in a position to know what the bishops were doing, to know what the cardinals were doing in abusing these minors, that is, those uh, under 21 years of age. He must have been aware of what was going on here. So I, one can easily see why Archbishop Vigano would say, well, he knows. He knows what I've said. But we must also be very wary of what this Cardinal Ouellette says, because if in fact, as the prefect for the congregation of these bishops, he certainly knew what was going on, and he's part of the cover-up. He didn't denounce this. That he, he himself must have gone along with this for years. In his capacity, as the prefect for the congregation of bishops, he was aware of it. What did he do about it? So when he answers Archbishop Vigano, we must have in the back of our minds, maybe in the foreground of our minds, that this man must know. But what did he do with that knowledge? Evidently nothing. That makes his response very suspicious, especially now after all this time that he's finally speaking up when Francis says, I will not say a word about this. He's got to go ahead to, to, to address and confront Archbishop Vigano. And he says in his open letter to Archbishop Vigano, he says, you urged me to tell the truth. He says, well, here I give you my personal testimony as the prefect for the congregation of bishops. He says, regarding the events concerning uh, Cardinal Theodore McCarrick, he says, your sensational public denunciation of Francis, even demanding that the Holy Father resign, he says, I'm writing this personal testimony based upon my personal contacts, archival, archival documents of the Congregation of Bishops. He says, I'm writing this basically to refute you and to reprieve, reprieve, reprove you, he says. He talks about how he had a collaborative relationship with Archbishop Vigano when Vigano was the Apostolic Nuncio in Washington. And he says, because his memory of their past collaboration was so good, he said that Cardinal Vigano's current position is incomprehensible extremely deplorable to him. He said, I once enjoyed your respect and your esteem and confidence, but not now. Well, I can see why he would say now that whereas Archbishop Vigano respected him, that he wouldn't respect him anymore because Archbishop Vigano actually held him up and said, this man knows the truth of what I'm saying. So Archbishop Vigano evidently did have the respect enough for the man to say he knows the truth and he will speak the truth. But now he's coming out and saying, I reject what you're saying. <clears throat> so what he's actually acknowledging is, I've lost your respect now by what I'm saying here. And you know, I'm sure he's right about that. I'm sure he has lost that respect. He says that what, Cardinal, what Archbishop Vigano has done is not a matter of communion with the successor of Peter, not an expression of obedience to Christ, he says. He says it's, it's about being loyal to Francis. Essentially what it comes down to is being loyal to Francis. Now that's the question. That's what it is to be loyal to Christ, to be loyal to Francis, he says. Okay. He talks about 
that is, Cardinal Ouellette talks about his own interpretation of Amoris Laetitia. <clears throat> Vigano criticizes Amoris Laetitia, and according to this document, this open letter, even criticizes Ouellette's interpretation of Amoris Laetitia. But he, he he's trying to point out here that well, Vigano is motivated by his opposition to Francis. That's what we're all hearing now. Oh, it's these ultra-conservatives and traditionalists in the church who've seen an opportunity to launch an offensive against Francis to try to get rid of him. That's their real motiva motivation. <clears throat> Again, they're not really addressing the accusation, the truth or the falsehood of the accusation. They're just saying the motivation behind the accusation is evil because they're traditional. And they want to bring down the, basically, they want to bring down Francis's reforms. In other words, they want to bring down the Novus Ordo, which they don't mention here, but basically that's what they're saying. This is really an attack on their Novus Ordo. We have to reject that because that's really the ultimate motivation they have in finding fault with Francis. All the time not actually saying that Francis is innocent of the accusation, which in their mind has nothing to do with it. You see, they see also that it is a matter of the legitimacy of the Novus Ordo. We need to see it the same way. That's what's at stake here, the legitimacy of their new order. <clears throat> In other words, <clears throat> that's what Car uh, Cardinal Ouellette is writing about here. That's what he's trying to vindicate. <clears throat> he's going to discredit Archbishop Vigano. Because he sees that Vigano's accusation is undermining confidence, <clears throat> even the legitimacy of their new order that they brought in. The, uh, the Cardinal Ouellette even says things that are nonsensical, completely nonsensical. He says that Amorius Laetitia is according to living tradition. Living tradition. Well, living tradition in the modernist mind means changing tradition. And a tradition is continually changing. How is it tradition? Again, an oxym oxymoron. Traditional change and changing tradition. It's an oxymoron. These two ideas are mutually exclusive. But he uses that expression as a true modernist. He even holds up that example of this living tradition, modifications, as he says, of the catechism of the Catholic Church. Well, how is modifying the teaching an example of tradition? If you're changing the teaching, how is that following tradition? Except to say what Francis says, that changing is just what the church is all about. That is the tradition. Everything changes. That's the one thing that is constantly true. So it's traditional. The church changes. <clears throat> Again, it's nonsensical to the mind of a Catholic. It is dogma to the mind of a, mo of a modernist. Uh, so even the changing of their catechism, he says, is an expression of tradition because they found a new teaching. It's modernism, pure and simple, blatant modernism. And the, man's, the man thinks like a modernist. Shouldn't surprise us in the least that he's defending Francis and his reforms because he says that's what's st at stake, Francis' the reforms here. So this Cardinal Ouellette <clears throat> goes on and says, um, that uh, when, when, when Archbishop Vigano spoke with Francis personally, after Francis was chosen the head of the Novus Ordo Church, and Archbishop Vigano says that Francis asked him, what do you think of Cardinal McCarrick? And Archbishop Vigano says, we have a file that big on him of his abuses and uh, denounced him basically to Francis as being not trustworthy, but actually very bad. Now Cardinal Ouellette is going to respond to that in saying that, look, when you talked to Francis at that audience, he says, I imagine the enormous quantity of verbal and written information 
that he, Francis, would have gathered on that occasion about many persons and situations. I strongly doubt that McCarrick was of interest to him, to the point that you believed him to be. At that moment, he says, McCarrick was an 82-year-old Archbishop Emeritus who had no appointment for seven years. <clears throat> he was living in retirement. So Ouellette is discounting the fact that, that, that Archbishop uh, Viganot says, I personally brought this to the attention of Francis because he personally asked me about this. And Ouellette is trying to find a way to dismiss this and saying that well, Francis wasn't really interested in this. You can't say, even if you did tell him this, you can't say that Francis really was aware of what you were saying or understood or even cared about what you were saying. Because in his mind, McCarrick would have been a nobody and it had no influence at this point. He was retired and he was basically out of circulation anyway. And here, Ouellette says, and furthermore, this, this brief, you say, contains the evidence against McCarrick. He said, well, this was prepared by us. He said, at the beginning of your service of 2011, it didn't say anything about McCarrick uh, other than what I told you about him and his situation. So he says, really, there was nothing in there that was that bad. We didn't have the evidence at that time anyway. So you see, this is Ouellette's way of just trying to discount uh, Vigano, the importance of what Vigano had told uh, Francis and presented to Francis. But notice this brief that Francis has continually said, go, he's told the journalists, go and look at this, go and read this for yourselves, read what it says. But the Vatican will not, will not produce it. Strange, huh? And now Ouellette is saying, oh, there's nothing in there of substance. Well, I'll tell you what, the Vatican has just announced, though, Francis, that there's going to be an investigation of McCarrick here. He's not going to do it, though. We'll see what, a, what the story is about that brief. You know, all of this redacted stuff that comes out of the government, the FBI and CIA documents and so on, all lines crossed out here and there. We'll see what comes out about this, this, this brief that Archbishop Vigano says is Exhibit A for the record of what these bishops actually knew about McCarrick all those years and reported about him. And now, finally, after all this time, they say, well, we're going to do an investigation after all. We'll see if what they produce is worthy of any credibility whatsoever. This Ulats goes on to say, I became prefect of the congregation on the 30th of June, 2010. He said, I never brought up McCarrick to Benedict XVI or to Francis until the very last days, he says, until just recently. I never brought him up to them. Um, I only brought him up to Francis and Benedict uh, after he was fired, basically demoted from being a cardinal. Um, he admits here, he admits that uh, Cardinal McCarrick had been from, 19, uh, from the year 2006 strongly advised not to travel, not to appear in public, but so as not to provoke additional rumors. So he was aware, he says, of all the rumors about McCarrick's behavior. And so, yes, he was strongly advised not to travel and not to appear in public or do these things which might provoke additional rumors about him. So he's actually admitting that these rumors were rife, so much so that he was advised not to do these things. But he's trying to say he wasn't ordered not to do these things. Well, they were just a private advice that was given to him for his own benefit to try to keep him out of trouble. But he, he's actually admitting something very important here, and he's admitting that he was aware of this back then. He, he, he denies that there were actually sanctions, though, from the Vatican against him that were put in place by Benedict and then revoked by Francis. He said, no, 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 no. There was just a, a, a strong advice that was given to him. But again, what he's saying here doesn't really ring, ring true. 
he's admitting a lot more than he's denying here, unfortunately. He says that there just wasn't sufficient proof against McCarrick over 40 years, over 40 years, all they had was rumors. And he, as the prefect for the congregation of bishops, with all of these rumors going on, he never found it necessary to investigate or to act and take anything more than just kind of giving McCarrick advice, stay out of the limelight, with all of these evil, evil rumors circulating about the terrible things he'd done. I'm sorry, but this letter is a condemnation not of Vigano. It's, a, it's an indictment against Ouellet himself. It's a condemnation of his modernism, and it's a condemnation that as the prefect for the Congregation of Bishops, he failed utterly, and he was, he's admitting he was basically a part, a big part of this cover-up. He's even acknowledging implicitly that Francis was, in fact, a part of this cover-up, and that Viganos is absolutely telling the truth. So anyway, so uh, he wraps up basically by, by saying, <clears throat> how is it, this is, this is Cardinal Ouellette saying this, how is it that this man of the church, McCarrick, he says, whose inconsistency is recognized today, inconsistency? Sexual abuse of minors? Inconsistency. How is it that he was promoted on several occasions, even to the point of being invested with the highest function of Archbishop of Washington and Cardinal? He says, I myself am extremely surprised by this. And I recognize the defects in the selection process undertaken in his case. Again, how lame is this explanation? And he says, I, I can't even understand myself, how he rose so high in the church, considering the inconsistencies about him, about his career. Um, but he says, you know, in the end, you can't interpret that as being a moral failing on the part of those who did promote him. Uh, there were just suspicions provided by witnesses. He says they should have been further examined. So again, he's acknowledging there's a fault at stake here. He's acknowledging that there is a grave fault on those who should have investigated what was brought to them. Again, he's admitting more than he's denying here. He says the fact that there may be persons in the Vatican who practice and support behavior contrary to gospel values regarding sexuality does not authorize us to generalize and declare this or that person as unworthy and as accomplices. Now, read that sentence again. It's just mind-boggling what these people are capable of here. The fact, and he acknowledges it's a fact, that there may be persons in the Vatican, in the Vatican who practice and support behavior contrary to gospel values regarding sexuality. He talks like such a modernist. He talks like just around circles. He talks in, in fog. It's just the fog rolls out of his mouth there. It's natural to him, right? It seems as a modernist, this is how they talk. The fact that there may be in the Vatican people who practice and support behavior against the gospels against the gospel teaching in matters of a purity, of sexual behavior. So the fact that these people may be in the Vatican doesn't authorize us to generalize and say that this or that person is unworthy. But wait a minute. If there are people in the Vatican, an authority in the, in the church, in his church, that actually practice and support others in, in practicing deviant immoral sexual practices, even the sexual abuse of minors, that doesn't authorize us to condemn this? 
It doesn't authorize us to say they're unworthy. What is wrong with him in saying that? It's, it is absolutely abominable what he's saying. And anybody who cares to translate that into plain English would say, this is absurd what he's saying. Of course, if there are persons in the Vatican who practice and sanction deviant sexual evils that are perversions condemned by the Gospels, we have not only the right to say that they, they are unworthy, we have the obligation to expose it and to say they un were unworthy to have positions of authority in the church, whether it be Francis or anybody else. How can he even say this with a straight face? It's just incredible. And he says, then to say that we don't denounce them, I mean, th to say that they're actually accomplices because they're practicing or sanctioning these perverted practices in the Vatican, from the Vatican. I'm sorry, but I mean, this letter, again, is, is, is such a glaring admission of guilt. We have to realize the evil of modernism. We have to realize what this is all about here. There are those who want to blame it on homosexuality. There's those who want to blame it on pedestry. There's those who want to blame it on, on pedophilia. There's those who want to blame it on this. They want to blame it on that. But the fact is, it all goes back to the fundamental problem that led all of these evils into the church, like opening, opening up the floodgate, letting the sewer flood the church, as John the 23rd said, to open up the windows and let in the fresh air. Yet this is the fresh air coming in from the world. Is that where John the 23rd is going to get his fresh air into the church from the world? Well, this is exactly what he did. What he did, he basically opened up the sewer line directly into the church and he let the, the sewer flood the church with his filth. This is modernism. This is the evil we're, we're dealing with here and this, we have to realize that. And the reason why they, they're, they're fighting it tooth and nail not only the liberals in the church of the Novichoro church, but even the conservatives of the Novichoro church have joined forces to combat this very suggestion that it really is modernism that is the fundamental problem, is because modernism has bred the Novichoro. The Novichoro religion with its new mass and its new sacraments, its new catechism and all the rest, this is born of modernism. This is the child of modernism. And they simply will not, they cannot admit that the Novus Ordo is the product of modernism and that modernism is evil. They cannot admit that. But they're going to have to, sooner or later. If they're going to be honest, they have to face the fact for what it is. What came out of Vatican II was evil. Modernism. And the practice of modernism is their Novus Ordo, their new order. It has to be rejected. And uh, Cardinal Ouellette goes on to say, I believe it incredible and unlikely from many points of view that we can accuse Francis of covering this up. Well, unfortunately, um, he's actually acknowledging, acknowledging what he's denying here, that Francis really is an accomplice in this because he says, the fact in Vatican, in the Vatican, that he says might be, might be saying there are. He has to admit the fact. It's a matter of public record right now. It's notorious right now that there are in the Vatican those who practice and those who sanction others practicing it and protect them. And as one cardinal re remarked not long ago, it is now worse under Francis than it has ever been before. Notice, again, you know, the letter of Cardinal Ouellette goes on to say, and therefore that Francis is being an accomplice in the corruption rampant in the church. He uses that expression. That Francis, to say that Francis is, is an accomplice in the corruption rampant in the church, he's stating as a fact that corruption is rampant in the church. He's not doubting that. He's not questioning it. He's just saying that you can't say that Francis is an accomplice in that. But he's admitting the reality. He says, for you to say, to come to the point where you say, 
He's an accomplice in the corruption rampant in the church to the point of considering him unfit to continue his reforms. Ah, there we are. That's the rub right there. To say that Francis is an accomplice to the extent that he is unfit. To say that Francis is an accomplice in the corruption rampant in the church, even an accomplice to the point that he's not fit to continue his reforms. This is unacceptable. This must be condemned. How could you have allowed yourself to become convinced of that? To say, again, I mean, to, to, to analyze his words in, in a reasonable way, He's not even saying that Francis, he's not even denying that Francis is an accomplice. He's saying that Vigano is, is claiming that Francis is an accomplice in the evil rampant in the church to the extent that he must no longer be con allowed to continue his reforms. So he's not even saying, denying that Francis is an accomplice. He's saying that, that accomplice, to say that Francis is an accomplice to that point, to that extent that we should not let him continue his reforms. We can't allow this. Anyway, I, I don't mean to belabor the point, as I probably already have, but I just think people need to understand what they're being told here. Uh, because if not, these words are being couched in a way to accomplish the very opposite of what they actually say. He says, Francis had nothing to do with the promotion of McCarrick to New York, Matukin, Newark, or Washington. We know that. That was never said by by Archbishop Vigano or anyone else. The Francis moved against McCarrick when the accusations became credible. I'm sorry, but there are those who are well aware of them ahead of time, even as this prefect of the Congregation of Bishops admits. And then he goes on to say that you should profit by the horrible scandal of the sexual abuse of minors in the United States to inflict such an unprecedented and unmerited blow on the moral authority of your superior, the Supreme Pontiff. Now again, I would say this statement makes it very clear that this is a political attack here. That he's guilty of the very thing he's accusing Vigano of being guilty of. He says that Vigano is guilty of a political attack on Francis. This statement of, of Cardinal Ouellette is nothing but a political attack on Vigano. How can he say that Archbishop Vigano is profiting by denouncing this complicity of Francis? The man is in hiding in fear of his life. He's lost everything his status in their, in their church, the Novus Ordo Church. Um, how is he profiting from this? The idea that he's profiting from it is absurd. But this is what Cardinal Ouellette is saying, that you should profit by the horrible scandal of the sexual abuse. So he's actually saying Cardinal, the Archbishop Vigano, is using the sexual abuse in the church for his own profit now. Not only is this not the truth, it's the exact opposite of the truth. Who is profiting from this? The very people who are doing all the covering. Ouellette and the rest of them. And Francis too. They're the only ones who stand to profit at all by this. Not men like Archbishop Vigano. The fact that Cardinal Ouellette could even say that shows what a liar he is. He's just, he's just lying to cover up. I'm sorry to say it, but it's really true. Archbishop Vigano said they're lying. And we see it right before our very eyes. If he's claiming that Archbishop Vigano is, is, is profiteering or profiting from the sexual abuse that this man and his bishops have done, he is the prefect of these men, is an absolute bald-faced lie. And to say that Archbishop Vigano is guilty of causing scandal by, by revealing it to the people? No. Honest people know that he's not the one causing the scandal. 
He is the one who's actually trying to unmask the evil so it can be stopped. This Cardinal Ouellette goes on to say, I have the privilege of meeting at length each week with Pope Francis in order to deal with the nominations of bishops and the problems that affect their office. You see what he's saying here. He's admitting responsibility in the choice of these bishops and the involvement of Francis. Every week, Ouellette says, he meets with Francis about the choice of bishops. This is who they've chosen. For him to say that Francis is really out of the picture, he's, he's kind of on the margins of all this, and then to say, I meet with him every week. I, the prefect for the congregation of bishops, I meet with him every week about these very matters of the nomination of bishops and the problems that affect their office. What are they talking about if they're not talking about this? If they're not talking about these rumors that are going around, what are they talking about? Again, he's admitting much more than he's denying here. His very denials are fraught with insincerity and corruption. He says, Francis deals with these things with great mercy. Oh yes, there we go again with great mercy. But he doesn't have mercy on the victims. No, no. He has mercy on his sexually perverted clergy. They're the ones he protects. And he even goes on to, to contrast Francis's way of handling those who've done these evil things with Archbishop Vigano's way of dealing, that Archbishop Vigano is sarcastic, even blasphemous, whereas Francis is so merciful. We see our Lord and his way of addressing the scandal of the young and say, woe to those through whom scandals come. The scandal of the young is so terrible. It would be better for those who scandalize the young to be taken out and thrown into the depths of the sea with millstones tied around their necks. Is that blasphemous? Is that sarcastic? Is that abusive coming from the mouth of our Lord? Yes, Francis is merciful, all right. He is merciful to the unmerciful abusers of, of children and seminarians. That's who he's merciful for. And in being merciful to them, in being merciful to the criminals, he is merciless to the victims. And we've seen it over and over again. And who led us here trying desperately to find a way to cover up the cover-up. That's what he's doing. He says, dear brother, I hope you retrieve communion with him. That's Francis, okay. And to end your open and scandalous rebellion against him. He says, you've aggravated the division and confusion. Well, you can't aggravate the division and confusion unless there's already division and confusion. He's just saying that Vigano did not create it. He's He's uh, intensifying it. He's making it worse. But it was already there. Come out of hiding, he says. Repent and retrieve. Repent of your revolt and retrieve your better feelings toward Francis. Make up with him. Oh, my. It's all about Francis. It really is. If he were not a man of prayer, if he were attached to money, if he if he were one who favored the rich, if he did not demonstrate energy in welcoming the poor, well, yes, we might decide there's someone better suited than he to carry out these reforms. But Francis does all these wonderful things, and we must not prefer anyone else. Stop telling him he has to resign, and we have to put someone in his place. He is a man of charisma and peace. He is the he is the one, the chosen one of God, to carry out these reforms. He says, these things dwell in him. Charisma and peace dwell in him by God's grace and the power of the risen one. Repent of your unjust and unjustified attacks. He says, your accusation is a political maneuver. This is a bald-faced political maneuver that Ouellette is making here against 
Archbishop Vigano. Says, come out of hiding, recognize Francis for who he is. Recognize him for the prophetic charism for the church that he has. For reform of the church. That's what it's all about, people. It's all about the modernist reforms. That's what they see. It's time everybody acknowledged that that's what this is all about. It's about the Novus Ordo. It's about modernism. That's where all of this evil stems from. They are in the process of murdering the church and providing an imposter in her place, an imposter of their creation in their modernist laboratory, creating Franken Church to take the place of the Catholic Church. Uh, we, have to, we have to face reality here. So I ask you please to uh, give some serious thought to it. Even their efforts to, to justify themselves cry out their own condemnation for their perfidy and their dishonesty and their destruction of the, of the very church they claim to believe in and claim to be serving. These are the reformers that St. Pius X uh, condemned in the encyclical against modernism. These are the modernists. We have to reject them, their works, their pomps, their depredations of the church. We have to return to the practice of the traditional faith. Well, may God bless you all. Please pray for me and I will be praying for you.